Hello, playing the devil's advocate, a phrase we've all heard before and possibly have said in some instance as well. It is used when someone during a discussion attempts to deconstruct a commonly accepted idea just for argument's sake. This person might even attempt to make a case for an idea one does not truly embrace. The goal is to lure one's interlocutors into a vigorous debate or discussion. It could come as a surprise to find out that the devil's advocate really exists. The story behind the devil's advocate. Next on Random History. The importance of the veneration of saints in the context of Roman Catholicism cannot be overstated. Saints are persons in heaven who lived heroically virtuous lives, offered the lives of others or were martyred for their faith. They are worthy of imitation. The importance of saints to a Christian, however, transcends their function as mere role models. After the saints have been received into their heavenly home, they never cease to intercede with the Father for their worldly brothers and sisters. The saints are the members of the Church who have arrived at perfect union with Christ. They join their wills to the will of God in praying for those in Church who are still on their pilgrimage of faith. By a Christian's devotion to the saints and their prayers of intercession, the unity of the Church is strengthened. Leading a pious life, dedicating one's life to the service of one's fellows, or even becoming a martyr for one's faith was never enough to be recognized as a saint. Performing a miracle is, as one could say in Latin, a conditio sine qua non. In other words, performing one or more miracles was absolutely indispensable for one to be proclaimed a saint. This condition is deeply rooted in the Christian tradition. One can trace the origins of this tradition in the first days of the Church. Two important questions arise. Who will judge that a person led a life of heroic virtue and who will certify that the prospective saint has performed a true miracle? In the first five centuries of the Church, the process of recognizing a saint was based on public acclaim. As was said, Vox Populi, Vox Dei. This is translated as voice of the people, voice of God. So the central authority, which was Rome, had no monopoly over the adjudication of miracles. By extension, the proclamation of saints was a decentralized and loosely regulated process. It was the local bishops who intervened for someone to be canonized. Canonization is the official term that describes the declaration of one as a saint. It all started by the spread of someone's reputation. Then the people would incite the leaders of their community to formally request from the bishop of the local diocese to intervene in his favor. The bishop would then study the request and a written biography of the candidate. If he found the case presented favorable, a decree would typically be issued. By this decree, the liturgical cult would be legitimized and thereby the person would be canonized. Starting in the 10th century, however, the bishop would send a summary of the cause to the Pope asking for his approval. This summary would contain eyewitness accounts of the people who knew the candidate and had witnessed his miracles. The head of the church would in turn review the cause and in case of approval, he would issue a decree canonizing the person as a saint. The first documented case of papal intervention is by Pope John XV on January 31, 993, for the canonization of Saint Urlik. Even though Rome's recognition lent greater prestige to a saint, it was de facto unnecessary for his proclamation. The support for Rome's saints seems to generally come from the higher strata of European society. However, other kinds of support were by no means excluded. By contrast, low saints tended to have more followers among the lower classes. It has been written that while Rome's saints had prestige, 
people saints had followers. This institutional sainthood sustained a religious heterogeneity of Europe. Sixteenth century Europe was in the grip of spiritual and political ferment. The Renaissance in Italy and Europe saw the emergence of important artists, authors and scientists. Copernicus proposed the heliocentric universe, which was met with strong resistance. Galileo Galilei became a champion of the new sciences. He invented the first thermometer and made substantial observations in the fields of physics and astronomy. Just to name a few of the imposing figures that contributed to the revolutions in astronomy and science in general. The Catholic Church could not stay immune to change anymore. In 1517, Martin Luther in Germany published the 95 Theses. It was a list of propositions for an academic disputation. In this document, Luther, a professor of moral theology, advanced his positions against what he considered as the abuse of practice of clergy. He stated his position against the selling of plenary indulgences. These were certificates issued by the church believed to reduce the punishment in the purgatory for sins committed by the buyers or their loved ones. Eventually, Luther was excommunicated in 1521, but never stopped criticizing Rome. Similar positions that challenged the authority of the Church were expressed by other religious reformers as well. Chief among these reformers, living in nearby Switzerland, was John Calvin. He was a French theologian and pastor, originally trained as a humanist lawyer. He broke from the Roman Catholic Church around 1530 and moved to Basel in 1536 after religious tensions erupted in France. In previous periods, Rome was in the position of geographically isolating its critics and their followers. The leadership of any religious movement was promptly physically removed by confinement or death. However, such measures were effective no more. The revolutionary thinkers had a new tool in their hands that helped them spread their ideas. It was an invention from the previous century, the printing press. Johannes Gutenberg was the first European to use the movable type in 1439. His major work was the Gutenberg Bible, the first printed version of the Holy Book. This invention was to become central to the religious turmoil that erupted less than a century later. Heterodox ideas about saints rapidly circulated throughout the entire continent. Ideas such as these fueled religious dissent involving people virtually from all walks of life. This turmoil contributed decisively to the eventual split of the Western Church into Protestantism and the Roman Catholic Church. The process commonly referred to as the Protestant Reformation. Rome was losing control over Western Christianity. Something had to be done. After the Protestant Reformation, the European political and religious environment was fluid. And this is an understatement. New religious movements were emerging all over the continent. These movements concentrated on charismatic miracle makers. Miracle makers such as these articulated strong messages of reform. Their methods of divulging their beliefs were never contentious or violent and their lives were exemplary. Followers, the better term is acolyte, flocked around these spiritual leaders. Eventually, new religious orders were created, the seeds of which were planted by the charismatic miracle makers. However, for a new order to actually grow, its acolytes had to receive some sort of recognition for its leader from Rome. The papal recognition would boost the reputation of the order. A stream of pilgrims would follow, wanting to visit the saintly body of the order's founder. Thus, donations, vital for the movement's survival, would be generated as well. Alas, the pious miracle makers were many, and their numbers were swelling. So the numbers of new religious orders were swelling with them. All were asking for Rome's recognition. Religious tensions grew higher and higher. It was time for change. A 
procedure had to be established through which the numerous applications for canonization would be assessed. The verification of the authenticity of the miracles performed by the spiritual leader of an order would be an integral part of the process. The impartiality of the procedure was of paramount importance. Its conclusions had to be perceived by the numerous applicants as unassailable. Pope Sixtus V in 1588 established the Congregation for Sacred Rites. This was probably the most important institutional change within the Church in Rome in the process of transforming sainthood. The Congregation was charged with dealing with the past abuses and inconsistencies of the process of canonization. A clearer path to sainthood was drawn. The procedures were lengthy and redundant, so the canonization process was more tightly controlled. A key institutional figure within the congregation was the promoter of faith. This figure was denominated Advocatus Diaboli, or Devil's Advocate. Central to the promoter's job was to prepare in writing all possible arguments against the recognition of a charismatic leader by Rome. These arguments seemed at times trivial. He was also charged with attempting to deconstruct miracles by finding alternative explanations for them. His role was rather unpopular since he had to go against the merits of often well-loved deceased individuals. Prominent figures of the Catholic Church served in the position of promoter of faith. Prospero Lamertini, afterwards Pope Benedict XIV, held this position for 20 years. He used his vast experience on the subject when he composed his monumental work on the beatification and canonization of saints. The presence of the promoter of faith was absolutely necessary for any act in the process of sainthood to be recognized. In 1634, the position became autonomous from the Congregation for Sacred Rites. The establishment of the congregation and the position of promoter within it was the answer of Rome to the religious ferment coming from the bottom. The Church managed to adjust to the changing times. Of course, not all claims to sainthood made by acolytes were accepted. Local concerns were, however, addressed by Rome in an organized fashion and tensions were largely diffused. In 1983, Pope John Paul II revised the canonization procedures. In the context of these reforms, the role of the office of the promoter of faith was significantly reduced. As a result, the promoter holds nowadays little sway over the proceedings, but the unofficial title of devil's advocate still holds its lexical charm, and rightfully so. By this term, the necessity of constantly challenging the conclusions of every procedure and sometimes even the validity of the procedure itself is underlined. Thus, the fruits of any deliberation are more trustworthy and the decisions made are more insightful. And this was the story behind the Devil's Advocate, the Church's answer to Tamalcius Times a description of how institutions successfully adapt to ever-changing conditions by addressing emerging difficulties. We would love to read what you have to say in the comments below. Stick around for a few more seconds because a couple of videos are going to pop up that might interest you. If you feel so inclined, please like, share and subscribe in order not to miss out on our future videos. Until the next time, keep learning.